All right, guys. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. It's really nice to have you guys here in our office. Uh, my name is Boris. If we, if we haven't met, that's because I've only been here for a couple months. Um, so uh, my background, just, just for your reference, um, I started out in uh, web design uh, and web development and then moved into product management. So most recently, I was at Samsung uh, working as a product manager for Android apps. Uh, we were making sort of locally relevant apps for the Southeast Asian market. Um, and as of a couple months, I'm, I'm here at Google doing developer relations. So as Amit mentioned, um, our goal is to really make you guys successful. Um, so today I'm talking about material design, right, which is uh, Google's new design language. Um, and I think the, the really important thing about uh, material design that we'll cover is that it was, it was built at Google, but Google is not the target for material design, right? The target for material design is your apps. Um, Google just happens to be the first customer of material design. So um, just, just for my knowledge, who considers themselves a designer in the room? Okay. And, and who considers themselves a developer in the room? Okay. And um, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote from when I used to work in New York at a company called Shutterstock. And uh, we did um, research with our users. We brought them into the office. We had them use our services. We tried to figure out like who are these people that pay for our product and, and how do we make them happy, right? And so we built personas. If you've heard of personas, it's where you take real users and you sort of figure out what the common characteristics are and then you make a persona. And so there's a couple different personas of users. And so Shutterstock is a design company. So of course we had designers and then of course we had marketing people. Um, but then we also had people that we called accidental designers. And those are people who like did not sign up to be designers at all. But because there was nobody else at their job who was doing design, or because it was like easier than bothering somebody else, they would basically buy images from Shutterstock and become the accidental designer. So um, let me ask again, in the course of your work as a developer, does anyone do design not because you're a designer, but because you're basically an accidental designer? Yeah, okay. So uh, material design is for you. Okay, so um, let's, let's get into it. Okay, so um, we'll do a quick intro about why material design exists. Um, we'll cover some of the main concepts behind material design. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about what that means for Android. Uh, because material design is actually not just about Android. It's, it's meant to be fully cross-platform. So it's, it's meant to be used on the web. It's meant to be used on your phone. It's meant for tablet. Um, but it's also meant for things like Android Wear and all the way up to TV. Right, the new form factors that we announced at I.O. or maybe even for the car um, at, at some point in the future. Right? Uh, could even be used in iOS to a certain extent. And then I'll leave you with some resources uh, where you can learn more and, and get started. Okay, so a long time ago, or, or maybe not so long ago in technology history, um, does this slide look familiar? This is, this is probably it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that long ago, right? We all instantly recognize what, what, what this is. Even though it doesn't look like this anymore, uh, this was the state, right? Where you had, you had Gmail on the web that was like this, this dense blue thing, right? Uh, which was revolutionary at the time. And then you had Gmail on Android, when Android was like gingerbread, and, and that's sort of like a gray design with some labels. And then you had the mobile web, which was really cool that you could actually be productive on mobile web. Um, but as you can see, all, all of these things are uh, pretty different from one another, right? So, <clears throat> fast forward to 2011, um, and Google started working on something called Project Kennedy. This is when the latest redesign of Gmail came out. If you guys remember when Gmail got that like big bold close button, um, and started looking a little bit different from the blue screen that we saw before. This was a result of Project Kennedy. And obviously I wasn't at Google at this time, but I was at South by Southwest in 2011. And there was a panel by a bunch of Google designers, like the, the chief designers working on the core products. And they basically told the story of how this happened. And so according to them, what happened was that Larry Page sent an email to his lead designer. He was like, you know what, I've been using uh, our products and uh, they all look super different from each other and they all look different whether I'm using them on, on my Android or on the web and, and on iOS they're also completely different 
and I switched from Gmail to Calendar to Apps, and like the consistency is just not there. This is a mess, and I need you guys to clean up, I need you to redesign, and I need it launched six months from today. And so cool. the designers were like, it, they were like, is, is he serious? Is this like a joke? Is this a threat? Like, what? I mean, we can't redesign all of our products in six months and launch them. Um, but Larry wasn't joking. He's, he's not really uh, a comedian, it turns out. So, so Google <laughs> internally took on this big initiative to, to redesign um, and, and launch a new skin on top of um, the existing products. Okay, so Project Kennedy succeeded to a large extent, um, primarily on the web platforms. It brought a lot of consistency across. It introduced like subtle gradients on the buttons. Um, it was quite a nice touch-up, right? Um, and around the same time, Android was really coming into its own, right? So Gingerbread was still like very kind of messy, and then when Apollo came around, it really gave Android a new sort of lease on life and gave it a personality of what it meant to design for Android. Right, so um, it, it, was, it became suddenly very clear when an app was designed with Android in mind, right? And you had consistency when you were switching between apps that followed Polo guidelines. And you also um, could tell when something was just like a port from iOS, and you'd be like, what is this weird back button and, and the share icon's off? And so Polo was the first thing that, um, that, in my opinion, was really starting to unify Android apps. Um, so we have Project Kennedy, and we have Polo happening on Android. So um, the end result, though, is that because these efforts were happening at the same time, you still had some inconsistency. So on, on the left is now what, what um, Gmail looks like after the Kennedy redesign, and on the right is um, Gmail running on a tablet with Polo, right? And there's still a fair amount of differences between these two interfaces. So Kennedy got Google a little bit closer, but it actually it, it didn't get um, all the way. Okay, but the thing is, it, it's not just a Google problem, it's really an industry-wide problem. Like, it's a hard problem if you think about it. How do I, how do I make my apps feel native on every platform that, they, that they're on, but how do I also make them feel consistent when users are switching between platforms, right? And so, it's a big, it's a big thing to tackle, and so Material Design aims to address some of that. Okay, so fast forward to 2014, at this year's I.O., um, Material Design was announced. And this is really the, the end result of the Android Hollow team and the Project Kennedy team, all those designers working together and being in the same room and saying, cool, we've both done good work, how do we sync up? Materials. Okay, so uh, Material Design is Google's solution to provide a coherent cross-platform experience for the users. Um, you can apply it, like I said, for desktop, for mobile web, for car, for smart TV, um, for, you know, for your wearable device, and more. And for Android apps, it's really an evolution on top of Polo. Um, so it builds on a lot of uh, what Polo introduced. Um, and like I mentioned, again, material design is built at Google, and Google is the first customer. Uh, but the real customer is, is the third party app. So uh, material design offers a rational approach to visual interaction motion design. So what I'll talk about is a couple of key principles that are really meant to help you make your design decisions. So the idea is that if you understand the principles of material design, then you don't have to think quite as much about what your animation should look like, what your visual styling should look like, how an app should scale from, from a small screen to a large one. Um, and material design is, is grounded in our understanding of the world as human. So that's where the material comes from, is that there's a physical metaphor that's at play here. So in, in many ways, it's an intuitive understanding of design as well. Okay, so let's talk about the core concepts of material design. And, and there's four of them. Um, there's tangible surfaces, there's print-like design, there's meaningful motion, and adaptive design. So in short, tangible surfaces is about um, the sheets of paper, if you've heard that expression, that material design is composed of. Print-like design, for anyone who's done print in the room, this is taking a lot of the concepts of key lines and grids and, and bringing those into the digital world. 
uh, which makes print designers very comfortable um, and also makes a lot of sense. And meaningful motion is about animation, not for the sake of animation, but animation being used to convey meaning um, and, to, uh, and to delight your users. And adaptive design is really a responsive interface. OK, so tangible surfaces. So in material design, a screen is composed of a couple different tangible surfaces. So sometimes referred to as sheets of paper. And they're basically arranged one on top of each other. They can be next to each other or they can be on top of each other. If a sheet of paper is on top of another sheet, then the sheet on top casts a shadow onto the sheet below it. So if you think of your phone or, or a tablet, right, you can think of like a light source at the, at the front here. And if you have a couple different sheets of paper, one in front of the other, you'll get to see a shadow. And so that's used to convey depth. So um, in this animation, obviously, you can see that there, it's kind of like physical paper, except it has a couple of magical properties. It can combine, it can split, it can be animated. Um, and looking at this, it all seems, it all seems plausible, right? Uh, but there's, there's um, a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of caveats. So um, I'll get into that in a second. So let's talk about this, this Z uh, plane. So the elevation here, if you look at the screen on the right, it breaks down what's happening to the screen on the left, right? So this is obviously flat, and to the end user it's flat, but from the perspective of building this Android interface, there's a Z depth and an elevation that you set for each of those elements that defines which one of those is on top of the other. So maybe as you scroll the interface, um, your ink, which is on the paper, might scroll below another piece of paper, which is on top. And maybe this, this yellow circle here, which we call the floating action button, or FAP, that sits on top of the two pieces of paper below it, so it casts a shadow on both of those. So for the end user, it's obvious uh, that that thing is in front, and so it gets a little bit more importance. And uh, in, in this example, you can see that when a, when a surface is at the front, it gets a pretty significant shadow, right? So that permissions dialog you can see there's like an overlay behind it. It's clearly in front of the map, um, and there's a nice shadow behind it. And another example of the floating action button over here. So this is a good exercise. As you start thinking about your, your app hierarchy and your design, um, try to think in concept of white frames. So these are, these are basically templates that we have available at um, google.com slash spec, or sorry, slash design slash spec. Um, and it lets you think of your app just in terms of these white surfaces, these pieces of paper, right? So can you convey the architecture of your app, how it's laid out, just with, with these tools in mind? Just thinking about what's on top of each other, what's next to each other, where are the shadows, right? Um, and it's also worth noting that um, the elevation that I talked about and the Z-level depth, it has its limits. Um, so, so basically, we like to think of the Z depth as the, as the depth of the device itself. So the Z depth is everything between the screen and the back of the device. Okay, so, so this maybe centimeter of space is what you have to play with as a designer um, or as a developer who's doing accidental design, right? Um, so the idea is that some things will be elevated and some things will be not elevated, but there'll be a limit to it. And in material design, you'll never see, for example, a sheet of paper flip, because that would break through the screen, right? And, and we keep this physical metaphor. So uh, everything is sort of constrained within the device. That's the metaphor that you want to think about. Okay, so that's tangible surfaces. It's sheets of paper that cast shadows and uh, can be arranged in various ways. Uh, the second concept is print-like design. Right, so for print-like design, in addition to these pieces of digital paper, we, we imagine digital ink. The digital ink is like the text, it's the iconography, it's the images in your app. It's basically the content, right? Um, and material design uses a lot of principles from print design to visualize this type of content. So one really important piece from print design is typography. And if you talk to a designer, someone will say, like, design is just about typography. Uh, there's uh, a pretty popular blog post that talked about that, right? And, and to some extent, you could make that argument, right? Like if you look at uh, a newspaper or a magazine, 
the typography is really what makes that interface important and, and special, right? Um, so presenting your content uh, with, with clear typography and it, it is very, very critical. And there's basically two things um, that are critical about it. So the first is the juxtaposition of the typefaces to convey context and meaning, right? So when you look at that newspaper, you see the headline stories, you can immediately tell which ones are important, which are the primary stories, which ones are the secondary. You can immediately tell what the title of that newspaper is based on the size and position of the typography. Um, and the other place where typography plays a really important role is branding, right? So if you think about the New York Times, like that's an iconic font that that New York Times has written in, right? It's Times. So it, typography, when it's so prominent, plays a very important role in branding. And so um, in print light design, and, and now with material design as well, typography is worth, is worth thinking about uh, because it, it's something that can uh, make people remember your application and something that helps you stand out. So um, let's look at this type heavy screen, right? And now let's do an exercise where we remove the icons and the photos and simplify the blocks using rectangles. Okay, and we get something like this, which we don't have any text over here, but this still illustrates the importance of typography, right? So based on the sizes of those text blocks and based on the arrangement and the colors, even with the text removed, we can now see what was the what was the subject of that email we were looking at, right? That's probably the thing at the top. That's probably the most important thing. Who are the people that participated in that conversation? It's probably those four darker blocks, right? We can maybe even guess that the thing on the right, I would guess, is a timestamp. I don't really remember if it was a timestamp. Maybe, right? And, and then there's the message right below it. So typography and color um, really conveys a lot of meaning regardless of what the, uh, what the content actually says, right? We understand intrinsically what the most important things are. Um, and material design offers a standard typographic uh, palette for you to use. The palette uses Roboto, of course, which you're familiar with um, already. Um, but you can, again, think about if there is a place in your interface to use your own font. Um, maybe you use Roboto for your main body text, but maybe uh, your, your most important piece of content, like the subject or the call to action, is, is in your own font. Um, the only thing I would say, of course, to think about with custom fonts is, is make sure that it's scaling well um, to different uh, devices, particularly if you're developing for wearables or for um, tablets. Um, just make sure it scales well down and up. And also, if you're localizing, it's very important to make sure that you know, there's foreign character support um, built in. Okay, so. Roboto has actually gone through um, a little bit of a change as well in material design. So those were exactly the, the things that the designers looked at. was like, how do we make this crystal clear on a tiny screen? And how do we make it appear beautiful on a huge screen like a TV? So with material design, Roboto has been slightly retouched um, to make it crystal clear and crisp at all, at all sorts of resolutions. So that's still a great default font choice. Okay, and of course, uh, there's also all sorts of font weights. So again, with the importance of typography, you should probably look, if, if you're just using one font weight, this is probably a very easy thing to think about to, to add visual appeal and interest, and also to convey the hierarchy of the content, right? It's, it's making use of the different font weights that are built in already. Okay, um, and now let's talk a little bit about arranging content in the space. So um, like traditional print design, material design uses a baseline grid. Um, and the baseline grid is eight dips, and, uh, or DPs as you may call them, density independent pixels, right, which is similar to points in iOS or uh, CSS pixels on the web. Um, but one of the key signature elements of material design is the use of key lines, right? So you see the lines kind of like the guides in Photoshop that you may use that, that go down um, the interface and line up all the items, right? So this makes it very easy for you to scan through the content and it's, it's basically pleasing to the eye, right? Print designers have done this for years um, and, and we're now sort of making sure that this happens all across the interfaces as well. Uh, if you think of like your college textbook or whatever, right? Always very clear, crisp columns that make it very easy to digest what is like the core body of context, what is the side note, um, and here you can see the icons line up with the content as well quite nicely. OK, 
Okay, bold color. Of course, this is an element that you would have noticed immediately with material design, right? And so with, with print design, color plays a huge role in the design, and now with material design on, on Android, on web, um, color is also very, very important. And uh, what, we, what we encourage you is to think big and go bold. So if you have a brand that uh, doesn't have a, a color associated with it, you should probably think and choose one, right? Most brands that you think about probably have a couple really bold colors associated with them. And with material design, it makes it really easy for you to use a bold color plus a couple accent colors that I'll talk about to make people remember your app and to make them instantly associate your app uh, with the brand by use of bold color. And material design also encourages dynamic use of color. So there's gonna be a library coming out called Palette, um, and what it does is if you pass it a bitmap, it's gonna return back um, a couple primary colors that are found in that bitmap as well as a couple accent colors. So this animation here, the colors beneath the images are actually dynamically being generated to complement the image that you're seeing, right? So there were third-party libraries to do this sort of thing before, but Palette does it quite nicely and allows you to think about dynamic use of imagery, especially if you have um, content like this. These are like album covers, let's say, or let's say you have user-generated images that are added in the application or photos. Um, with the Palette library, it makes it really easy to incorporate those, those colors. And like print design, um, you want to think about using visual imagery as much as you can to immerse the user. So if you look at these screenshots, there's not that much chrome, right? The content is really king, and that's, and that's a principle that you've seen um, for a long time, but with material, we're taking it to the next level, right? So if you look at that top screenshot, there's just very thin black borders around that content. It's almost all imagery, it's almost all content. So we want to go edge to edge whenever possible and fill the images with, with beautiful, uh, sorry, fill the screen with beautiful images, right? And this applies actually very well both to mobile and to tablet and to desktop. So uh, immersive contextual imagery is another sort of hallmark of material design. Very little expect on decoration, very little on frame. Okay, so we talked about tangible surfaces, the pieces of paper, we talked about print line design uh, with, with uh, guides and, and with a baseline grid and with the importance of typography. Let's talk about meaningful animation and motion, right? So basically in, in the real world, this is the thinking, in the real world, we don't have a lot of like jump cuts, right? So I'm moving back and forth to the podium, you have the context to where I was, where I'm going, uh, I'm not just appearing and disappearing. And the idea with uh, interface design with material is the same. You want to start thinking less in terms of jumping from one screen to another screen and more about giving a user context about why this screen just appeared, where it came from, and then when they dismiss it, where it went so they know where to find it again. And meaningful motion helps you do that sort of thing. Okay, so in this example, um, we're, we're touching uh, a card, which is a piece of paper in, in the material sense. Um,